Merci. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Africa is playing a particularly important role in today's conference. Now, why is Africa hosting this conference? It has been archaeologically proven that Africa is the cradle of humanity. Our ancient wisdom tells us that if the root is ill, then the tree's leaves will fall and the, tree, the tree's fruit will rot. Whereas Africa is suffering from wars, conflicts, poverty, intolerance, the world and all of human civilization, if this is the case, will be in chaos and disorder. Africa is a priority for UNESCO and helping Africa is our responsibility for each and every one of us. As for Venerable Master Chun Kong, through the Association of Master Chun Kong's Friends, has contributed to sponsoring and conducting a study on the contribution of interreligious dialogue to peace in West Africa. This study was conducted by the Africa World Institute, and it will be our honor to see an overview of the study in a few minutes. Now, I would like to open our first panel on the topic of the contribution of interreligious dialogue to peace in Africa. And now I'd like to invite Father Jean-Pierre Alouchery, the canon of Cathedral St. Louis in Versailles, full member of the Academy of Science, Humanities and Arts of Versailles in Ile-de-France, and board member of the Institut Afrique Monde to come up on the stage. And I also would like to invite the speakers for this roundtable to come up and join him, Professor Kami Kuyu, who is a professor of law and president of the Orientation Council of Institut Afrique Monde, Mr. Nicolas Klingelschmidt, who is a consultant and member of Institut Afrique Monde. Reverend Father Guillaume Bruté de Remur, a formative theologian, as well as Dr. Emile Mosley Batamak, professor of philosophy and member of the Board of Institut Afrique Monde. I'd like to ask you all to come up on the stage. Thank you very much for being here with us. Please have a seat. And let's give you one round of applause to our moderator and speakers. You have headphones available if necessary so that you can listen to interpretation of languages that you may need translated. And now, I'd like to give the floor to Father Jean-Pierre Alouchery, who is our moderator 
for this round table. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as well as our distinguished speakers on our panel. I have been asked to be the moderator of this first round table to replace a colleague that is currently on a mission in Yerevan. Now, I'm obviously not from the African continent. Fifty-five years ago, I was a young student in a UNESCO club at Versailles. And we were very concerned about apartheid at that time in South Africa. And just like you, I listened to my teachers who had a goal to achieve within a very limited time frame. Now, I won't be controlling uh, the amount of time that each speaker speaks. Now, as a member of the board of the Institut Afrique Monde, I as well am very sensitive to the joy and suffering of Africa and its population. And I've spent many years myself in Central Africa, I'm a member of the Interreligious Group for Peace in Versailles, and I took part in various meetings of culture ministers that took place in cities and various places of worship. Now, putting your heart into peace with an open mind is our daily ambition, and especially at UNESCO, which in our common house welcomes citizens from all over the world. Professor Ami Bragg, a member of SHU France, has spoken quite topically about the role of religion in his recently published book from 2018. And in this book called The Scapegoat, he analyzes the myth of ritual murder. And religion belongs to peace and war alike, violence and peace. And it is from the heart of man that evil arises. And in, at this round table, we are asked to share our experiences so that we can learn to better live together. This is not the place for heated debate based on strong opinions. Now, we are looking eagerly forward to hear words about harmony and tolerance. And when it comes to tolerance, we've seen a major debate when uh, at Versailles with regard to Article 10 of the Declaration on Human Rights, August 23rd of 1793. And we've seen great judgment shown, open-mindedness and wisdom in a reality that unfortunately is often wallowing in ambiguity and inaction. We will hear Kami Kuyu, a professor of law, as well as Mr. Nicola Klingel Schmidt, who is a consultant at Institut Afrique Monde, Reverend Father Guillaume Prute de Remur, who is a theologian and a rector at a Lebanese seminary, and Dr. Emil Mosley Batamak, professor and member of our Institute, Institut Afrique Monde. We will now hear from them. Professor Kami Kuyu. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ambassadeurs, Mesdames, Messieurs, distingués invités, c'est avec beaucoup de plaisir que je viens partager avec vous les résultats de l'étude que l'Institut Afrique Monde a menée sur la contribution du dialogue interreligieux pour la paix en Afrique de l'Ouest. Je remercie de tout cœur les organisateurs de ces colloques pour m'avoir invité. Mesdames et Messieurs, 
Le dialogue interreligieux. Ladies and gentlemen, interreligious dialogue is not a new phenomenon in West Africa. The peoples of this African region have always lived in harmony without ethnic, racial, or religious discrimination. And for many observers, religious discrimination and conflict are new to West Africa. They are thought to be linked to socio-political crises, Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal, which you'll be focusing on today, have experienced these types of social and political crises. The conflict at Casamance, which is the oldest ongoing conflict in Africa, and the crises of 2003 and 2010 in Côte d'Ivoire are still lingering in people's minds, and they have led to great loss of human life, as well as the destruction of infrastructure and property. These conflicts were wrongly presented for political reasons as being religious conflicts that set Christians against Muslims. To address these conflicts, the international and national mechanisms of conflict resolution and um, stability and peace building seem to be ill-adapted. These mechanisms generally consist of resolving issues using rule of law or through peace agreements that aim mainly to reconcile hostile political classes at the expense of the true victims. Many social science researchers believe that the resolution of community conflicts is based on restoring a broken social bond or creating a new one. Law and force in and of themselves cannot restore or create social bonds. And the deeper regulatory mechanism can be found in the people themselves and their people to restore themselves, the social fabric torn apart by conflict. Intercultural and interreligious dialogue viewed as the encounter of the other with mutual respect is one of these regulative me mechanisms. Now, interreligious dialogue is not new to West Africa, as I just said, but what is new is the emergence and proliferation of initiatives that aim to strengthen people's capability of engaging in dialogue and therefore preventing conflict in a context of restored peace and relative political and economic stability as well as external extremist Islamist threats. And so I was able to observe and to study some of these initiatives during a field study that I took part in in Abidjan a few months ago, as well as when I was a professor at the Catholic University of West Africa in Senegal. And now I would like to briefly, given the time allotted to me, uh, present to you these initiatives. I will begin with Côte d'Ivoire and finish with Senegal. In Côte d'Ivoire, four initiatives seem of special importance to me. Firstly, the Forum of Religious Confessions. Next, the initiatives led by the Sant'Egidio community, the initiatives of the saint Philippe de Bobo Sabye Parish, and those of the Center of Research and Action for Peace, or SERAP which is a Jesuit university. So these are the four important issues I want to talk about. Now, first of all, the Forum of Religious Confessions. This forum was established in 1995 by a group of researchers called Gerdes Côte d'Ivoire, the center of studies and research on democracy and economic social development of Côte d'Ivoire, supported by various Muslim, Christian, and animist organizations. And today it includes 25 different religious confessions, including the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, Islam, 
Protestant and Evangelical churches, Buddhism, and independent African churches. Since the beginning of the crisis of 2003, many religious leaders have decided to work hand in hand in order to promote peace. In a declaration issued on October 18, 2002, this forum of religious confessions expressed its concerns and asked the citizens of, the, of Côte d'Ivoire to create an environment full of unity and love, which are fundamental values for all religions. And the message sent out by the forum was then disseminated by various religious leaders within their communities and to their members. According to all the people that I spoke with, it is interreligious dialogue that ensured that political crisis did not devolve into religious conflict. And this dialogue also allowed the citizens of Côte d'Ivoire to understand that the conflicts that were threatening their country were not religious but political in nature and the impact of this message of peace from religious leaders was immediate and helped to prevent the country from spiraling into unprecedented violence. Today, this forum is continuing its work, but there are ambivalent relationships between certain religious leaders and political power. There are some that aim to control the forum and use it for access to resources, and this damages our institution's uh, credibility. The second initiative that drew our attention was that of the Sant'Egidio community. The Sant'Egidio community is renowned throughout the world and took active part in the quest for peace in Côte d'Ivoire during various conflicts. Since peace was restored, this community has been working on a daily basis to strengthen social cohesion. It seeks to foster peaceful coexistence of various peoples within the shanty towns of Abidjan. It works not only with religious groups, but also with the most vulnerable populations. The Santa Giudio community does not present itself in underprivileged areas as being a Christian association. Through its schools of peace, the community focuses in particular on working with young people. Young people have been working, especially on social media, by sharing videos with other young people. They are attempting to turn the tide back against negative ideas. Despite its neutral position, the community often suffers from misunderstandings and even attacks, but the people also often appreciate its activities and promote its work. Currently, the Santa Gidio community is providing academic support in a predominantly Muslim neighborhood, in fact, in a school of the Quran, upon the request of the Muslim community. The third initiative that caught my eye was the reconciliation campaign at Abobo Sagbe. After the 2010 crisis, the post-election crisis, that is, which was traumatizing for the population of the Abobo commune, a reconciliation campaign was launched under the auspices of the St. Philip Parish between November 27, 2011 to January 8, 2012, together with uh, legitimate and customary authorities, allowing for free participation, allowing people to talk about what they experienced and as well as express their bitterness and their concerns as well as their anxiety. The goal was to help victims heal from internal wounds, to forgive one another, and to turn people's backs upon violence and vengeance. And this campaign was followed by spiritual actions, that is confession and healing, as well as traditions of reconciliation. And the last initiative that I would like to share with you today comes from the Center 
of research and action for peace, also known as CERAP, which is, as I mentioned before, a Jesuit university. And so this center has launched communities in the interest of the community after the post-election crisis. This service began activities to re-establish social cohesion through inter-community dialogue in three areas of Côte d'Ivoire. The goal was to bring together members of the community to work together on inter-community projects in order to foster more encounters, more exchange, as well as solidarity and dialogue. And by working together on these inter-communitary projects, many bonds were forged allowing the participants to learn more about each other and understand each other better. There are two activities that particularly struck my attention and perhaps deserve special mention. Firstly, the cleanup of intercommunitary cemeteries in the city of Agboville. And this activity, as I'm sure you will have noted, is of great symbolic importance. The other activity was the cleanup of the courtyard of the Agboville Hospital by young people, as well as the building of a community pig farm. And so by working together within these framework of these activities, local peoples were able to learn more about one another and understand one another better. These various initiatives, which we have brought to your attention, allow us to create bonds and effectively prevent future conflict because behind all of these projects, the goal is to exchange more with the other, the other with whom we don't necessarily share the same religion. I'd now like to move on and talk about Senegal. In Senegal, where I was a teacher for many years, I was unable to identify any institutions bringing together religious leaders such as we could find in Côte d'Ivoire. However, Senegal is still a unique country when it comes to promoting interreligious dialogue. And so what are the most promising initiatives taking place in this country? First of all, the initiatives of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. This foundation was established in Senegal in 1976, and in 2009, it created a work group on interreligious dialogue with the hope of promoting a dialogue between cultures and religions. It also established a scientific committee made up of experts as well as secular scholars representing all of the religions existing in Senegal, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and traditional African religions as well as Buddhism, etc. To date, this Conrad Adenauer Foundation has produced about 15 publications, both online and in print format, even comic strips on religion and interreligious dialogue. Beyond these publications, this foundation has also held various events on religion and dialogue. This foundation also works with many other partners in many other fields. And this field work has pr promoted living together and social cohesion, as well as dialogue between members of different religious communities. The second initiative that we noticed in Senegal is the teaching of religion at the Catholic University of West Africa. Based on a partnership with the Catholic University Center of Bourgogne, the Catholic University of West Africa, or UCAO, in Senegal, offers a bachelor's and master's degree in, at Dakar in the area of science of education and religion. And 
by making use of their training in their institutions. Students who graduate from this program contribute greatly to enriching the interreligious dialogue in Senegal. Two comments, however. The first is the exogenous nature of this education program. This is a sort of program that was transplanted into Senegal. It was designed for French students, and therefore it often overlooks the complex religious reality of Senegal, especially African traditional religions and certain Muslim brotherhoods. The second comment is that the Catholic University of West Africa is a private tuition-collecting university, and therefore only the most well-off can access this training program. And the third experience that I want to share with you is the experience of the village of Popengin in Senegal. And so every year in Popengin there is a Christian pilgrimage that takes place, a Catholic pilgrimage. And what's the most striking is that this event is organized by a local committee chaired by a Muslim and made up by a majority of Muslims. It is charged with all the preparation work for the event, including cleanup, water supply, sanitation, accommodations, electricity, food, and so on. And so how should we be viewing this harmonious coexistence? I think that this comes from blood ties based on the concept of sharing common blood as well as homes and beliefs. In addition, matrimonial alliances are very important for strengthening social bonds. And in this village, mixed marriages between Christians and Muslims are extremely common. And in every household in this village, there are Catholics and Muslims. They can belong to different religious communities. Each follows their own beliefs while respecting those of others. The Sereres of Popenkin, whether they're Muslim or Catholic, therefore do not view their religions as being mutually exclusive. The traditional system of social organization and family ties is robust and cements the bonds between social actors, whether or not they share the same religion. And so Popangin is an excellent example of interreligious dialogue and solidarity. Other experiences such as that of Conrad Adenauer Foundation and the Catholic University are also essential contributions for peace in the region. And to conclude, I would like to note the importance of interreligious dialogue for West Africa, not only in order to prevent conflict, but also to promote harmonious coexistence of communities and to strengthen peace. Interreligious dialogue for West Africa is also a powerful pillar against Islamist extremists who are now all too often rampaging in these areas of the world. Interreligious dialogue is possible when we can meet with each other and discuss our issues together. Nothing can replace concrete experience of encountering others. Interreligious and intercultural dialogue is not necessarily based on reason or rational thinking. It's based on relationships and encountering other people, understanding other people is only possible if we have an exchange allowing us to better understand each other. And these initiatives I mentioned to you today have allowed populations that belong to different life communities to engage in exchange. And they clearly show that interreligious dialogue is not something that's on paper only. It exists in practice as well. Distinguished ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, now allow me to wrap up my remarks by citing 
some data on education. I believe that it is important to promote education on religion in West Africa as well as in all countries of the world. And it is indeed very important to acquire vast knowledge of religions, their manner of teaching, their practices, everything that they lay out with regard to one's attitude towards oneself, others in the world. We must understand their origins and understand their context, their evolution. This is an effort that ought to be one of the key mandates of a school can help identify your limitations, outdated concepts, perhaps even distortion, but also the greatness of these religions in which we can find beauty, truth, and common good. And in local customs, we can find the teaching of historic great religions and the humanist lessons of sages and philosophers, whether by agnostics or atheists. Now, studying religion is, has to come from school because it has a double mission of teaching students to think critically and to live in society in a multicultural world. The religious factor is a human one. Religion is everywhere. And it is in order to better understand the current world that it has, the, the re- teaching of religion has been uh, strengthened in France, even though there has been some resistance to this idea due to an outdated understanding of what secularism is. Now, the, t- the goal of teaching religion is to develop critical thinking skills with respect to founding texts uh, by shedding light on these via knowledge and being able to analyze them critically. Knowledge can help us uh, eliminate the risk of being too dogmatic or too blind from our beliefs. But it does not undermine reason. Belief can also have a critical dimension without being dogmatic. In conclusion, I would like to say that uh, education on religion highlights the fact that compassion is what religions share the most. It is the key and fundamental value of all religions. Compassion is certainly a common value which we can use to build a true and universal peaceful society. I believe that it's important to promote education in compassion in our schools. Compassion means that we understand other suffering as well as wish to help improve their lot. Thus, school is the most ideal venue for for teaching these humanist values. Now, promoting empathy and compassion in schools will certainly uh, teach our children to be wiser and have a greater sense of their responsibility. Experts believe that this kind of education among the youth is one of the best methods for preventing violence from becoming entrenched in our society and therefore uh, building a peaceful world. Conflict and violence are, are, have arisen risen from the lack of love and compassion. Now, teaching compassion in schools will also help us educate adults and parents about the suffering of others, which is far from what we have today. A study was conducted at Harvard University involving over 10,000 young Americans. It was published in 2014 and showed that almost 80% of children stated that their parents were less interested in others than in their children's success and in their own success and their own happiness. I am sure that intercultural, interreligious dialogue and education, which are so important to UNESCO since its creation, will allow us to create a culture based on love, compassion, and peace for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kuyu. And next, I would like to invite Mr. Nicholas Klingelschmidt to take the floor and give us his presentation. 
Venerable Master Chun Kung, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. The study which we have completed concerned three, cult three countries with very different religious landscapes. And within these countries, in a context of crisis or rebuilding peace, uh, dialogue always took place in the form of specific actions. And these initiatives uh, depended on the level of conflict or, in some cases, on the amount of interconnection between the religions. In Benin, religions played a very important role during the end of the Matteo Caracu regime, and they allowed for a p peaceful transition. So that is why, for almost 30 years, Benin has been a model of political stability, as well as social and economic stability, and has exemplified tolerance between these communities. Now, in this society, there is religious pluralism. For example, there are Abrahamic religions, but also religions that are native to Benin. And we can see, of course, there are some tensions in Benin society that are of concern to us, but also there is a dialogue that involves all sides. Uh, for example, this dialogue can take the, pl take the form of interreligious conferences where common ideas and objectives are dis discussed, and the overarching goal is maintaining peace and development and avoiding conflict. Now, official statistics reflect that uh, present Benin as a mostly Christian nation, uh, but actually there is a quarter of the population which is Muslim and almost 20% uh, practice a traditional religion, especially Vodun. Just like in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, religious communities are distributed unevenly across Benin territory. For example, there are there's a mostly Muslim population in the north of Benin at the border with Nigeria and in the south, mostly Christians. In the southeast, which is the cradle of Vodun, uh, we have the Wida sacred forests in which most uh, the population practice Vodun. Vodun. Now, although it seems to be the norm in Benin uh, that a lot, a lot of people practice traditional religions, especially Vodun, uh, it is important to note that traditional religions seem to be regressing according to official statistics. Now, voodoo in Benin is not only a religion in and of itself, but it's also a vehicle for cultural markers for the entire population, especially in the south and center of the, of the country where ancestor worship originally appeared. Although, according to statistics, the number of worshippers is falling, Nevertheless, it's, a, it's important to note that voodoo is extremely symbolic for the country. Uh, sometimes people even think of religious, discuss, describe the people of Benin as exhibiting religious pluralism because some people go to the mosque or the church, but uh, they also secretly visit traditional religious leaders or voodoo healers. Voodoo, just like other local religions, is a very important phenomenon in Benin. And it's, it plays an important role in interreligious dialogue, just like in other Western and Central African countries. Uh, Professor Emil Batamak will talk about this in a few moments. Now, the relationships between religious worshippers and so those who practice more mainstream religions and those who practice voodoo are also very complex. For example, native traditional leaders uh, have helped uh, more traditional religions uh, in certain ways, and then the, the traditional religious leaders feel that their worshippers sometimes are victims of discrimination. For example, Sarah Balogu, who is the, the head of the voodoo religion, stated that children who come from families practicing voodoo have difficulty attending some private Catholic schools if they have undergone initiation ceremonies in their families. Other st students' parents have also stated similar observations, saying that the teachers in schools discriminate against students who practice voodoo because of their religious beliefs. Now, although Benin is a very stable country in an unstable region, there are some tensions, especially in the northeast of the country. Now we can see from inter-religious dialogue that, for example, in the in the region of Jugu, there has been some problem with problems with radicalization. 
there are also some radical Muslim sects with young radical preachers. Their financing, their source of or financing and organization is very opaque. And all of this is taking place in, in areas where local government has lost control of the situation. Now, in these types of peaceful, pluri-religious societies with some occasional problems show that civil society and local leaders have uh, organized interreligious dialogue over the past 20 years between Muslims, Protestants, Catholics, as well as traditional religious leaders and even atheists in order to encourage them to get to know others, uh, respect their religions, in order to maintain peace and prevent any kind of dialogue breakdown. Now, there were three uh, major interreligious dialogues. The first was organized in 2000, 2007 by uh, UNESCO. And then there was one in May 2015 by the Pan-African Center uh, in Cotonou. And then in 2017, there was another large uh, summit organized by the Espace Afrique Association. Now, all of these involved about 100 of national and international participants with representatives from all of religions, traditional Ben Benin religions, for example, uh, Protestant, uh, Voodoo, Shiite and Sunni Muslims, Catholics, etc. There were also various artists, worshippers, religious leaders, universities, uh, representatives of civil society, government representatives, and multilateral organizations who were present. And there were four main ideas that were discussed on the role of interreligious dialogue and how it can be promoted. So this was discussed at a summit organized by GloGPE. So there is now a framework for interreligious dialogue helping to create specific projects encouraging interreligious dialogue through specific actions and increasing awareness of religious beliefs. Finally, we hope that education will be encouraged everywhere, specifically education regarding peace and interreligious dialogue. Now, interreligious dialogue must not only take place at the level of interreligious leaders who participate in these forums. As we can see from the Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal experiences, this dialogue has to take place on a daily basis between members of the population via joint projects while respecting uh, people, different populations' beliefs and through education. And so the Benin interreligious model is mostly characterized by the work of Professor Belgeret, who founded the initiative A Different Path for Peace. UNESCO supported the launching of this initiative in May 2015. And Cotonou, it was also supported by UNDP and the International Organization of Francophonie as well as the African Union. The, this project is the, pro is the product of regional coordination and it, ha it ha has the participation of three representatives, uh, three religious representatives, so Christians, Muslims, and native religions, as well as a representative of women's organizations and a youth representative. So there are three regional bureaus that have been founded. And this allows each minority to have its own voice in each chapter while discussing projects. We prevent anyone from being excluded from this. So here we see one. We can, we can see the embodiment of a conclusion of these interreligious conferences. We have created a framework, a permanent framework for religions to maintain interreligious dialogue. Uh, these projects are also accompanied by very active uh, work of the Pan-African Social Prospects Center, which is the executive secretariat and which sends teams on the ground. Also, we work together with various organizations like Caritas, uh, which has been participating in development in the country for many years and has necessary technical knowledge. 
Now, for over 10 years, the community of the brothers of the Protestant Church have created an interconfessional center at the border with Nigeria in order to conduct this Peace via Different Path program. And this center brings together all religious communities that are participating in this project, as we can see from the statement of a uh, pastor. He said at the inauguration, quote, our mission is completed. We would like to thank the Muslim community as well as the native religious community, which have supported us in order to make this project a reality. There have been other development projects over the past two years within the framework of the Peace via Different Path. Um, these have been coordinated at the local uh, level. For example, we have had hygiene projects, water projects, uh, public sanitation products in southern Benin. We have brought together members of different communities, linking their members which who are living into religious dialogue in their daily lives. While maintaining these infrastructures, uh, the, those who are responsible for it are representatives of local communities. Now, Director Kalkashue, who uh, leads an organization participating in this organization, he says that rather than preaching into religious dialogue, we have to act and we have to live together with different communities, um, Christian, Muslim, other confessions that must work together in order to uh, realize work on priority issues for community development. Now, beyond these kinds of projects, everything we have seen shows that peace, in order to be maintained, requires mutual understanding and tolerance, not only in daily life, but also in our spiritual lives, which is the second main idea of the interreligious conferences that I was telling you about. Uh, believers who know each other, who are properly educated, who know about their beliefs, and who are aware of others' cultures and traditions, uh, they will ha experience less fear and less misunderstanding. Thanks to active dialogue and education on other religions, each member of the population knows what kinds of values he shares with others, what kind of uh, habits and traditions he shall have, whereas respecting those of others. This better understanding of the other in terms of uh, religion can take place in places of worship. We have already uh, made opened up places of worship in several areas to allow believers of different religions to meet each other. Uh, for example, uh, Theophania, the House of Peace, which was launched on May 19th, 2018 in Ajati. It is an open space for followers of different religions. It includes a Christian area for prayer, as well as a Muslim prayer area and a temple area for voodoo worshippers. It also attracts visitors, but is also a place of spiritual exchange. So Benin's experience uh, leads us to four conclusions. So we can see that there is permanent dialogue, there is cooperation on specific development projects, there is increased awareness of others' beliefs, and the fourth aspect is education. Education is a vehicle for interconfessional education. And, for example, school has just begun in Takon, uh, the school year 2018-2019 school year has begun and we can see how children in this city are being educated in different religions so that they can learn about their common values. The goal is to show them what the links are different, between different religions and have them participate in interfaith activities. In conclusion, the population of Benin is quite young and if it is able to maintain its joint cultural markers, it should be able to maintain peace while avoiding extremism. The experience I have shared with you today shows that Benin is adapting an innovative approach in preventing violence. We hope that other countries will follow Benin's example and that other initiatives 
will soon be launched across Africa so that tomorrow Africa can become a model for peace and development. As Professor Albert Tivoyer put it very well, if we cannot attach a soldier to each citizen in order to protect him, the only option left is to strengthen our mechanisms for living together in spite of our differences. Thank you. Merci, Nicolas. Thank you, Nicolas. And now I would like to... Prenez la parole. Father, I'd like to now give the floor to Father Père Guillaume Brotet de Remur. We look forward to your presentation. Excellencies, uh, distinguished ambassadors and permanent representatives to UNESCO, I would like to begin my presentation by first thanking the organizers of today's conference for giving me this opportunity to share my experience of 20 years in the Middle East and in Africa. I would like to specifically thank the president of the IAM, the Institut Afrique Monde, um, Madame Hofoué Boigny, for kindly inviting me to this conference. I am here not because I have studied interreligious dialogue in Africa, but because over the past 20 years I have been working in the Middle East, and I will give you, a, I will introduce myself to tell you more about my work. I am the rector of an organization which works also in African countries uh, that uh, have Arabic-speaking populations. So I was born in Montpellier in France, and I studied in Rome to become a missionary priest after being a, a secular missionary in Madagascar for three years at the neo catechumenal Way. In 1995, I was ordained by Pope uh, St. John Paul II, and I would like to remind you that in 1986, he launched the first International Day of Prayer, the Interreligious Day of Prayer for Peace. I think this is a very important event. And the Pope in 1999 sent me as a rector of an international seminary, an inter-ritual international seminary to Lebanon. It uh, trains Catholic priests, missionaries uh, who will travel to all Arabic-speaking countries and Middle Eastern countries. And we, at the seminary, we welcome young people from the entire world, from Africa, from the Americas, Asia, Europe, the Middle East. So we're not limited to the Middle East or Africa. These are young people who attend the seminary and prepare to work in all uh, churches in the Middle East and uh, Arabic Africa. In this seminary, the values of internationalism and inter-rituality inter-religious values are key so that we can ensure that these young people will have an open spirit and will be able to work as actors for reconciliation, dialogue, and peace in this region. As you know, this region is still torn by numerous political and inter-religious conflicts. The Vatican II Council uh, wished to open these types of ceremonies these types of seminaries so that priests are able to exceed the limits of their own diocese, their nation, and their right. Perhaps you know that the churches in the Middle East, the Catholic Church, but not only the Catholic Church, they are uh, divided into small um, confession-based communities in the Middle East. Now, before giving you a more theoretical explanation of my experience over the past 20 years in this region, I would also like to give you some specifics. I would like to show you a short video which we prepared several months ago to provide you with an introduction of our work in Beirut. We are currently preparing the main building of our seminary, which is a surprise for the people of Lebanon. We decided to build it in a very important memorial site of the Lebanon War on a line that still marks the border between the Muslim Quarter and the Christian uh, neighborhood of Beirut. I think that this will serve as a nice introduction to my presentation, and let us play the video now. 
Je rappelle très bien que je suis arrivé, il y avait une petite route qui n'est plus maintenant, au milieu de tous ces immeubles tout autour. So there's a short, small road between all, all of these buildings which have been destroyed. I felt inspired and I said to the Lord, if you can give me a building like that to allow, allow me to rebuild it as a sign of the war, war scabs which are healing. And after 17 years, the Lord gave us the building that I had asked for. My name is Father Guillaume Brute de Rimura. I am French. I attended the Rome Seminary, which had been founded by Pope Saint Jean Paul II. In 1995, I was ordained by the Pope, and I was sent to Beirut as the rector of the Redemptorist Mater Seminary. This is the capital of Lebanon. Now, before Lebanon used to be a majority Christian country, the only Arab country that was not mostly Muslim. So it's a unique country because there are more than 17 different confessions. If you walk around Beirut, you'll see an Orthodox church in the Byzantine style, and maybe a, a, you'll see a, a minaret, a Shiite minaret, or a Sunni uh, Sunni minaret. There is a wide variety of confessions in Lebanon, and Lebanon is a very important country. Pope Jean-Paul II said that Lebanon is not a confession, it's a mission for him. It's a way of showing to the world that different religions, different confessions can live peacefully together. This is where we are building the seminary. You can see that these, uh, the site was destroyed in the war, and I think that this is the biggest scar in Beirut. On the right, we can see the mostly uh, Muslim neighborhood, and on the left is the Christian neighborhood. This was the demarcation line between the two, and there was there was uh, a, a severe bloody fighting in this area during the civil war. Now, one could think that we can just forget about this scar, but we can't. What we want to do, what we can do, is we can uh, bring new energy to this area. We can bring new blood into it. When I met with Pope Francis to describe this project, he told me something very important. He said, you must train, uh, you must train courageous, courageous priests. So brava in Italian means bravura and courageous, brave. So those who died in the war, they're considered to be war heroes. Now, when I speak of courage, I don't mean the courage of war, but the courage of love, of forgiveness. This is what we need. We hope that God will give us the strength to love and to forgive. So I hope that this building will be uh, a witness to hope and a sign of love and forgiveness. So following this video, I would like to begin to give you more of a theoretical overview. From what I have learned, I just want to say that I came to Lebanon without any experience in interreligious dialogue. 
I was relatively familiar with non-Catholic religions. I had studied theology after all, and I had studied a bit of Islam, Buddhism, and so on. So I did have some ideas of what I was facing with, as well as regard to religion as a whole. Now, I want to cite the homily of Pope Paul VI, so actually quite a long time ago. In 1964, Pope Paul VI, during the Pentecostal Mass, announced the creation of what today is the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. It was called at the time Secretariat for Non-Christians. And in this homily, which he made in order to explain the reasons behind the establishment of the Secretariat, he said, we must understand the psychological and moral novelty in the word Catholic, in the hearts of men, the word Catholic does indeed find a profound yet vague insti instinct toward universal expansion, but also it finds a terrible fear, a tightness, constriction that won't let it enter. The heart of man is small and selfish, thinks only of itself and a few other people, that is its own family, its own clan. The heart of man constantly seeks barriers and boundaries that it can use to measure the world and to take refuge. But if the term Catholic could really penetrate into man's heart, then all of this egoism would disappear. The class spirit would become social solidarity. Nationalism would serve the interests of the global community. Racism would be eliminated. And all forms of totalitarianism would be exposed as inhuman. The small-minded heart would be shattered, or preferably would acquire an unprecedented capacity of expansion. A Catholic heart means a heart with universal dimensions, a heart that has overcome the ego, the radical fear that prevents man from dedicating his life to supreme love, that is to say, a generous heart, an ecumenical heart, a heart that can hold the entire world inside it. These words, spoken by Pope Paul VI in 1964, demonstrate to us the wealth of Christian spirituality, which aims to expand the heart of believers in order to provide universal dimensions to their hearts, to give them hearts that can welcome all men and women without discrimination, that can have a dialogue with everyone for the common good. And this is the main lesson taught by Jesus Christ, who accepted his death by pardoning those who were killing him. This opened, uh, paved the way for absolute pardon, the fruit of the supreme love. And the mission of the Catholic Church is to help people experience this kind of unconditional love. It is this love they received from the Father, that is Lord God, which the first Christians showed in their small communities, to such an extent that at the end of the second century, Tertullian, who was a father at a church in Northern Africa, spoke of it in the following words, it is a practice of charity and love which endows us with special status in the eyes of certain people. Look, he said, how they love one another for his own people, the culture that is based on individuals. People hate one another. He said, look how they are ready to die for each other, for his own people were more inclined to kill one another. And so you can see that the experience of the first Christian communities was viewed during the first three centuries AD as representing pardon, love, reconciliation, and dialogue. Today, at least in the Middle East and Northern Africa, it seems that we have strayed quite far from this initial vision, judging from the wars and conflicts that are devastating the region. There are many reasons for this, economic, social, political, but I want to emphasize one reason, because this is a belief that uh, I came to support after 20 years there. 
the loss of this Christian sense of Catholicism has led to withdrawal of communities into themselves and has submerged them into an identity-based vision of religion, which means that today being Christian means that you have to belong to a certain community. And this therefore leads to social isolation and often an adversarial relationship with other communities and with people who do not belong to our community. And so identity-based uh, rhetoric is the result of a more institutionalized vision of the church, and it damages the image of a more community-based church. It is encroaching on people's minds and is leading to an adversarial conception of social and intercommunity relations. A respectful dialogue no longer seems to us to be an alternative to self-affirmation, and confrontation with others appears to be the only solution. Now, to resolve this deadlock. In my experience, we need to act along two main principles. One is ad intra, so within Christian communities, and the other ad extra, that is outside of Christian communities. So, training, teaching Christians, teaching them to discover a true spirituality that would open their hearts to the transcendent nature of of God would transform them through faith in Christ. The more we focus on this spiritual aspect, the more it is truly experienced, the more the heart will expand and allow individuals to overcome their fears, to open up to dialogue by fully incorporating the idea of having a Catholic heart, bearing this love taught by and lived, experienced by Christ, which he expressed to us through his gift. And what does this mean? Ad intra means training educators and missionary priests when they are our in our charge. So after between eight and ten years of study, they'll be able to overcome these barriers and engage in a true dialogue. This is the international and inter-ritual nature of our activities. That's why it's so important. And currently, there are 21 priests who have studied at our institution. Nine of them work in Africa, in Sudan, Egypt, and Tunisia, eight in Lebanon and Kuwait, and four in South America, working with Eastern minorities. And these priests work to train the Christian communities in which they teach this kind of open-mindedness, this progressive growth of the Christian spirit, allowing people to become, in their everyday lives, agents of reconciliation, thanks to their experience of reconciliation with themselves, with others, with their history, and with the conflicts that they often have suffered from. The Commission experience has been quite positive. There are many cases, I won't go into detail on them, but there are many cases of people who have become real agents of forgiveness, of dialogue in conflict situations when it comes to their work or their families, their societies in which they live. Due to their maturity, they have been able to promote dialogue and have allowed for the creation of a community that truly lives together. This is a very meticulous work, uh, labor of love, which is like a transplant, a skin transplant. You need to place healthy cells into wounds so that it can help to restore the skin damaged by by divisions and war. And as mentioned in by previous speakers' remarks on Africa, this is extremely important. We need to train people when it comes to responsibility, respecting others and oneself, teach them what true love is. This experience, education of young people, often done in schools, can also be carried out through certain plans that we execute with families, helping people in difficult situations, young people people, adolescents who often have, are caught in the crossfire of various tensions and that have trouble finding their own place of belonging and often therefore lose their open-mindedness, we help these families that guide and support these young people. 
and empower them to also become agents of dialogue and reconciliation, because it is these young people who, in the future, will be the agents of a society in which respect of others and respect for dialogue are the foundations of conviviality. And this experience took place, for example, in Cairo, it was quite successful there, as well as in Sudan. And in Tunisia, we have a, a young priest that has been living there for over a year and has already been able to carry out some of these interreligious events, for example, a Christmas concert when young Muslims actually came to the Christian church to sing carols. He also took part in the interreligious encounters uh, held by the government of Tunisia with the great rabbi, rabbi of Tunisia who lives in Jerba. And so these are all initiatives that may seem small in scale, but these young priests are truly showing enormous talent and diligence thanks to their education in our institution. The second axis of action is the ad extra pillar. So once the Christian fabric has been healed and restored, we must turn towards the outside world. As you can see in the video, we uh, wanted to establish headquarters for the seminary, and this we chose as this area a very symbolic site of the civil war in Lebanon, in which different communities killed one another. And these were buildings that were destroyed by a conflict that had a deep effect on the entire region. We also want to purchase a third building, which we want to transform into a place for encounters and for dialogue on culture. After examining the neighborhood and the people who live in it, we found that it's a working class neighborhood that requires solidarity services, especially education services for children. So we want to offer academic support, making use of the synergy of all communities in the neighborhood and open a language school because language is the key to uh, comprehension. If we don't understand one another, we don't trust one another and then may view the other as an opponent or an enemy. And we want this third building to become a center for a cultural exchange in which people can meet one another, can speak to one another, and engage in dialogue. So this was my humble experience. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that this conference will be very productive for all these initiatives throughout the world that are working for peace, harmony, and living together. Thank you. Professor of Philosophy, Dr. Batamak, will now be speaking to us about a very important topic, which really ought to be taken into account, that is the traditions of religion in Africa. Your Excellencies, distinguished ambassadors, Distinguished guests, I am truly happy that we can share this moment together, even if it's quite short, only 15 minutes according to the agenda. But what's important here is that I want to share with you that I think we need to reflect in depth on the situation of traditional African religions in Africa. And I would like to, first of all, thank the organizers of this conference, of this three-day event, on dialogue and education in their interreligious aspects in order to show the world, which is very important for all of us, to show the world that we can build a future based on peace and harmony because we all need harmony today as well as tolerance. Without tolerance, we would not be here today to speak about religion. I would like to thank the organizer 
that is the delegation of the Côte d'Ivoire of the Sultan of Oman, UNESCO, of the Republic of Nigeria, the World Buddhist Organization, the Pure Land Learning College Association, the Association of Friends of Master, Venerable Master Chin Kung at UNESCO. When we speak about African religions, for me, this is the second opportunity I've had to speak on this topic. The first time was at the College of Berlin. I can't mention that here without specially mentioning someone present in this room who on the initiative of Institut Afrique Monde, of which I am also a member, and who has, since the creation of this institute, has sought to ensure that there would be a department responsible for reflecting not only on religion, but also, more importantly, on inter religious dialogue. And within this context, I was able to speak for the first time on behalf of Institut Afrique Monde at the College of Berlin during a colloquium on interreligious dialogue. Now, if we stop the works of our predecessors, if we say before this assembly, that speak that we're speaking about uh, African traditional religions in a complete way, then I think that many of us might have a bit of difficulty understanding, simply because African religions on their own continent are actually rather little known rather marginalized, because for us, we want to have a critical but effective dialogue. For me, interreligious dialogue must be critical, but also based on emotion and empathy. And the three studies that we heard about, which were explained by the previous speakers, including very interesting contributions from the Arab world, are issues that we are discussing often in Africa. We often discuss the issue of these three major religions, the three book religions, you could call it. And these so-called book religions, compared to the tolerance that the Venerable Master Chin Kung promoted, we must understand that there are major gaps in the structure of this interreligious dialogue in Africa. Now, I'm not talking about the details, but I'm talking about the overall structure. Because we're talking about this dialogue today, for example, in Mali. And that leads us to a fundamental question for all of us. That is, the hunter society of Mali, which is both a religious and spiritual organization, is not participating in this dialogue. And when we invite speakers on this dialogue at the Elysee, for example, why don't we include associations like these and incorporate them into the dialogue? I think, personally, that there is a portion of this dialogue which we are missing out on due to certain customary procedures that lead us to believe, for example, that Africa, Africa, which is the cradle of civilization, the origin of man as we know it, such a fertile ground for religion, 
we often forget that this fertile breeding ground for religion is such is such because all the religions that have come from it already have an exceptional religious life because if they did not exist then I'm not sure at all that the current proliferation of religions, the diversity of religions that exist and are still emerging in Africa would have been able to benefit from this vast platform. And so this study seeks to clarify and shed new light on this kind of marginalization of African religions, which I would call the religion of African tradition. And here, my diction and word choice is extremely important. Traditional religion, that's a rather misleading term, because traditional behaviors, this doesn't really mean anything. What does religious tradition mean? This is the religion of African tradition, rather. That is to say that African tradition is the tradition of the ancestor, the founding ancestors. And all religions in Africa share some part of this concept of the founding ancestor. Christianity, for example, is a religion that obviously is based on Christian tradition. And so we need to invest more and become more willing to engage in dialogue with people from these areas and to learn more about the others as they are, not the, in the categories that we wish they would fall into. And this is, for me, a question of primordial importance in our discussion of interreligious dialogue. So this contribution, quite briefly, consists of presenting religions in their facts and arguing that interreligious dialogue ought to take place in a spirit of brotherhood and openness. And based on the hermeneutical approach, we ought to find common ground in our situation. That is to say, if African religions seem to be known throughout the world to be inclined towards syncretism, this is because these are religions that are open to other beliefs, to the beliefs of the living and the dead. And so, religion of oral tradition, of oral civilization, we must here distinguish between oral civilization and oral tradition, because oral tradition is a practice that favors oral culture over written culture. Now, oral-based civilization is a civilization that emphasizes oral custom, as well as text and what is written. And so now, I hope that we will be able to, you'll be able to examine the religious texts that I have distributed so we can see what exactly the nature of African religion consists of. Because religious, re African religions often are faced with a difficulty. We want to find a sort of version of the New Testament or Old Testament uh, in these religions, a, for example, a certain specified format, writing in Latin and so on, what we're used to. But unfortunately, African religions, as well as those of other cultures that are not European, have evolved to meet their own needs. And so they have a form of writing, a format that perhaps is not in the form of, of books, but rather texts. And what does that mean? This means that these are religions that were not created 
in order to fit into a book. Rather, they evolved. So can we see these African texts, if possible? They were created in order to be expressed in a, through a different mental structure related to hieroglyphs, for example, ideograms, drawings, codes, which means that people need to be educated and informed in order to understand these religious texts. Unfortunately, it hasn't been able to be put up on the screen, I'm sorry, but I will continue anyway. So, these texts are of vital importance. They must be decoded, discovered, understood, and these texts show us the mental structure of these African societies that rely heavily on symbolic thought. African thought is structured in a symbolic manner, and African religions all have this in common. There is a link between symbolic thinking and art. If you look at African art, you will find that there is a major symbolic or symbological aspect in this art that clearly comes from religious thought. For example, this on the screen is a type of rope you can find in Congo, and it can be actually read like a text. This is a sacred text that also is made to appeal to the everyday man and woman. It must be decoded, just as you would have to translate Japanese or any other form of writing. And so here you have this text in this form, which people must be able to understand if they wish to understand the structure of African spirituality. And so since we do not understand all of these dimensions of African religion, we have found, unfortunately, that discus discussion often focuses either on religion or sociology or ethnography, and it loses sight of the cult cultural, ethical, and spiritual aspect that is so important in order to understand these religions. And so, we must discuss a hermeneutical question, that is the question of texts. African society, as I mentioned before, is one that, is, that relies heavily on texts. This society, when faced with book-based religions, have difficulty engaging in dialogue, and we need to structure this dialogue while taking into account the specificities of each participant. And today, as in the past, we have man many religious and political leaders in Africa of all ages. And can you please show the other images on the screen? photos of religious leaders who were photographed last year to show that these religions were really alive. And this was on the occasion of a large demonstration, a large event in Cameroon in an institution that studies African religions. There were hundreds of them, and all of these religious leaders were leaders who did not take part in interreligious dialogue, which means that in most of these countries, we come from from the entire uh, region of Sub-Saharan Africa. But when we actually hold interreligious dialogue or event, they are not present. But their presence or absence is not the key to resolving the issue of interreligious dialogue, because even priests with, that I'm friends with, African priests, believe in ancestors, believe in priests as well as ancestors. And you can see here that in traditional religions, some of them 
believe in African religion as well as Catholicism. So you can see this flexibility of the uh, of these religions, which means that we need to show that when we talk about interreligious dialogue on the African continent, we have to first and foremost think about these religious leaders in a structural manner, and then we can create together a lasting structure and approach. And the other thing that I would like to emphasize is that in this very house, in 1965, a work, very important work, was published. I have a small uh, one version of it printed out there, and it's about uh, the religions of black Africa. And this was an initiative that came from Ms. German de Tillen. And this text on black Africa provided us with a great deal of substance regarding the experiences of religious, relig African religions and spiritualities. So this text I was mentioning is over there. So here it is. It was published by Galima. It has been published in this pocket edition for quite a few years. For those of you, those who really uh, need to read it, those who want to read it can learn about Africans, but uh, you can have an entire overview of all African religions in this book. So I would like to invite everyone to read this book. I would like to offer a copy to Venerable Master Chen Kung so that he could familiarize himself with it as well. So what does the holy text tell us? What is a religious fact? What can we learn from it? What is holy? What should a holy man's ideals be? African religion from the African tradition is it a religion, as Pateba says, he sa states that it is a religion which is based in the earth, in nature, that one can worship at every moment during one's life. It inspires men and women with every action, every word they speak. So this book discusses the meaning of holy, of holiness, and also it discusses a study that reveals the basic facts of religion and the various new forms of expressing this religion. What we are doing today in our actions, in our what we are asking for, because that's what I believe we are doing, is we hope that the religious leaders will help us create connections in our religious discussions and our religious lives because in order to learn about one another, to meet one another, we need to know each other, to discuss, to have discussions. We have to accept the other in our discussions, but we have to accept others even if they are radically different from us, not uh, if they are radical, but if they are radically different. We have to understand that the other is unlike myself, but we will begin a discussion. And if we talk about life, the life of the dead and the living, then you will certainly be able to achieve something together. Dear guests, the crisis of the model man and of our spiritual and religious beliefs, as well as uh, the lack of passion for Western beliefs that developed in Europe, lead to 
a situation where each religious event is part of human history, as Mircea Eliade said. This means that if we have a religious crisis somewhere, this doesn't mean that this is the end of religion or a religious crisis. It's simply a momentary setback in this area, but religion will always come back. Because what is religion? It will remain what it means to us, because only religion is able to raise certain questions, and only religion through uh, cultivating our beliefs can attempt to bring us solutions to these problems, answers to these uh, questions. Thus, today, as has been the case for centuries, what we see is that there are some hostile attitudes towards any kinds of religious ideas. This is still the case today, and Father Lelon mentions this in one of his works, saying that in this context, people remain, uh, well, people uh, remember Einstein's words, religion without science is damaged, is lame, but science without religious is dead. This is a statement made by the great thinker Albert Einstein, and this should spur us to think about this issue on a deeper level. So, cultured individuals, agnostic individuals can all work together thanks to the importance uh, given by religion to the diversity of beliefs. Uh, we can uh, obtain, uphold human dignity. But often when we speak of promoting human values, for, such as true freedom, justice, respect of others, uh, courage, plentitude, we can do this through religion. So in conclusion, I would like to say a few words and here again, I would like to mention a great thinker who uh, was a Jesuit priest. His name was Engelbert Mveng. He was a researcher, one of the organizer of black art festivals in Dakar. Unfortunately, he was murdered in 1995. And what I'm about to read you is his last uh, interview that he gave to a, a colleague who was also a researcher. And he said the following, If there is a solidarity in our suffering, the world and Africa are sick in solidarity, and they are sick with the same ills. And it is through uh, this uh, his pleading for rehabilitating man in Africa as well as, the, as, well as across the world that uh, Engelbert Veng said goodbye to us in the last century and through uh, examining the interdependence of human communities he called on Africa and the world to be more generous to those who suffer. Those who promote interreligious dialogue and spiritual dialogue uh, actually are continuing to embody this message because this is what brings us together uh, in this context today. In the report which will be uh, presented today. Moreover, they also bring together different peoples in solidarity. This is what Veng was calling on us to do, because this is considered to be key in order to establish uh, discussions that will be fruitful to bring peace to man, peace with history, and peace with himself. 
by, um, uh, by emphasizing what M.A. Césaire said, which is that uh, we are talking about all men. We can accomplish this. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Batamak. We had a wonderful morning today with many uh, in our audience. I'm extremely impressed by all of the presentations. Thank you for them. We are now uh, approaching lunch with, after 12. I know that we're supposed to have a Q&A session. And I think we will move now to the uh, room of actions, the Salle des Actes, because we are going to look at an exhibit there. It will be the inauguration of the exhibit Tolerance, Understanding, Coexistence, Oman's Message of Islam. Uh, I would like to thank all of our audience members, and I would like to conclude this meeting with these words. Thank you. May we invite uh, the panel to take a group photo before you step off the stage? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Indeed, it is very sad to witness what had happened in Africa. However, after listening to the talks provided by our first panel, I'm sure we're all very heartened that each and every one of us are putting in effort to establish peace and harmony in this war-torn region. Before we proceed to lunch, the organizers have jointly put up an exhibition titled Tolerance, Understanding, Coexistence, Oman's Message of Islam. It is being put up just outside the hall, next to the Monaco table. That's how they label it. Do spend some time going through the exhibition. It is a multimedia presentation of, uh, uh, by Oman, and you will learn a lot more into the message of Islam. Lunch boxes will be provided for every one of you. You do not have to fight for it. There are more than enough lunch boxes for everyone. We'll be back here at 2 p.m. to start our afternoon session. So enjoy lunch and at the same time, enjoy the exhibition. Thank you very much. Ami Tofo.